Welcome to Middle School Science Praxis Preparation Module 4, Chemical Reactions and Physics. This module is a partnership with TLC Tutoring Company and Arkansas State University. To begin with, we want to start with physical versus chemical changes. There's two general types of change. The, the physical change is where the appearance or form of the matter changes, but the kind of matter in the substance does not change. So consider like melting an ice cube. Once it's melted, it's still water. It's just a different form. Or dissolving salt into water. You still have salt and you still have water. They could be separated again. Or making perhaps like a homemade trail mix if you mix the pieces together. You, didn't phys you only physically change the appearance. You didn't chemically alter it. Now, a chemical change is the kind where the matter changes and at least one new substance with new properties is formed. So, you could say like baking cookies. You put the ingredients together, but you have chemically changed, you know, the baking soda and the flour. It's different than it was before. Or burning wood in a bonfire. That reaction changes the nature of the wood. Or, you know, mixing baking soda and vinegar and releasing carbon dioxide. You have made something new. Now, as we've talked previously, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So in chemical reactions, the amount of matter that is being reacted is always consistent. Even though it might change forms, appearance, or properties, this is called the conservation of mass. Uh, for, for instance, uh, if you mix high HCl, hydrochloric acid, and sodium hydroxide, NaOH, this will form NaCl, salt, and H2O, water, per this reaction. Now, notice that the number of atoms is consistent, even though the water and salt are very different than the acid and the base that they originated from. This is the conservation of mass. The number of atoms must be conserved. So, let's try this. Let's remember that all chemical reactions must be balanced and that the number of atoms must be consistent. So, take this chemical equation for the combustion of octane, uh, C8H18. And if it's not currently balanced, let's balance it. So, first of all, we're going to note that all the carbon and the hydrogen in the carbon dioxide and the water must come from the octane. So we're going to change the coefficient of CO2 to 8 because there's 8 carbons in an octane and the only place the carbon could go is the carbon dioxide. So there's 8 carbon dioxides. In the same thing, there are 18 atoms of hydrogen in the octane and there's 2 atoms each in the molecule of water. So we need 9 waters. Now, we check the oxygen and we see on the, on the right side, I now have 25 oxygen atoms on the right and only 2 on the left. Well, we change the oxygen coefficient to balance it. So now it's balanced. But there's one more step we need to do. We can't have half an oxygen molecule. We have to use entire molecules to do it. So we're going to scale up the entire equation so we get whole numbers. So we multiply all the coefficients by 2, and you get 2 octanes, 25 oxygens, 16 carbon dioxides, and 18 waters. The equation is properly balanced because this shows the conservation of matter. Both sides have 16 carbon atoms, 50 oxygen atoms, and 36 hydrogen atoms. Now, once we've looked at chemical reactions, there are some major types of chemical reactions. So combustion, which we just looked at, is a reaction where a fuel reacts with oxygen to produce gaseous products. So the internal combustion engine, rockets, a bonfire, these are all combustions. An acid-base is a reaction between an acid and a base, and water is one of the products, like we saw hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. That's an acid and a base to make a salt, sodium chloride, and water. Synthesis is a reaction when you take two substances or more and you combine them to form something more complex. So, you know, the formation of sugars, you know, during photosynthesis, this is a synthesis, photosynthesis, when you combine to make a more complex reaction or more complex substance. And then decomposition is basically the opposite, where I take something complex and I break it apart into simpler ones. When I take a sugar and I break it down to its component pieces so that I can uh, you know, exhale it as carbon dioxide and release energy, that is a decomposition. So synthesis and decomposition are opposites of each other. Now, further, 
chemical reactions usually involve generating or consuming heat. So first you have two basic options. You can have the exothermic reaction. So exo like exiting a reaction that generates or releases energy. So this could be heat or light or sound. So an explosion, right? Uh, you know, a something that gets hot or something like, uh, you know, a fire, right? That is that's releasing heat energy. And these reactions can be spontaneous. They can just happen on their own or they're very easy to start because the system wants to release this energy. So we've talked a little bit like if you want to make salt, you can take sodium solids and chlorine solids or chlorine gas and you can make two uh, units of sodium chloride. But that salt has a much lower energy. So uh, this is also going to get very hot in the container that you are having it in. It's going to make or release a lot of energy. Now, an endothermic reaction, think endo in two, the reaction must absorb energy in order to proceed. And these reactions are never going to occur spontaneously or very rarely. Work has to be done to accomplish them. So a temperature drop in the surroundings might be observed. Maybe the beaker gets cold or you have to keep adding energy or the reaction just stops. So photosynthesis, which we've mentioned, takes sunlight and carbon dioxide and water to make uh, uh, glucose you make to make uh, sugar and oxygen. This is kind of the fundamental generation of you know of sugars in plants. This is how they use sunlight and, and turn it into sugar to then turn it into energy. So this, if you take away the sun energy, the process stops because you have to be constantly supplying the energy or it won't work. Now. To pivot a bit, we're going to talk a little bit about force and motion. So most objects have the ability to display motion, which is changing position over time. So as objects move, how far it has moved can be observed and tracked in two ways. So distance is a scalar quantity. That means it's only a magnitude. So it measures the distance that an object travels regardless of direction or heading. So this could say, I ran four miles, or I measured 275 centimeters, or I traveled 12 parsecs. These are all distances that don't have any reference to where you're going or the direction you traveled. Displacement is what we call a vector quantity. Vectors have both a, a size, a magnitude, and a direction. So it'll tell you how far an object has traveled from its current position. So we could say a car drives 50 miles curving through the mountains, arriving at a destination that is 30 miles from their starting point. So that's as the crow flies. So the displacement is 30 miles, but the distance is 50. That's the easiest dis the description between the two. Now, similar to motion, uh, the rate of change in position can also be given in two forms. So we can have speed, again, a scalar that only has a magnitude that just says, how fast is a body moving? So this could be 55 miles per hour, you know, MPH, 20 meters per second, things like that. Now, velocity, the same as displacement, is a vector. It has a speed, you know, it has a, a magnitude and a direction. So it has speed and its direction. So 55 miles per hour north, 10 meters per second southeast. You have to have both a size and a direction. Now, the third level would be the rate of change in rate of movement. So that's a rate of a rate is called acceleration. So that is the change of velocity. Now, note it's velocity, not speed. Acceleration records change in velocity. It's a vector quantity. So any change in speed or direction results in acceleration. So you can see this here. I have someone who's running and they're speeding up or they're on a skateboard and they're slowing down. Those are both acceleration. But also this B is moving at a steady speed, but constantly changing direction. This is like when you go into a hard turn on a road, you feel the acceleration, you feel the pull on your body, even if you're going the same speed. That's because you are accelerating because you're changing directions. Now, the, the general laws that govern motion is what we call the Newton laws of motion. So we start with forces. So forces are just pushes or pulls that act upon these objects, right? Resulting in changes to the object's velocity or position or other properties. So Sir Isaac Newton is an English mathematician and astronomer who is credited with establishing what we call classical mechanics of physics, or otherwise known as Newtonian physics. 
So while he had many contributions, he's probably best known for his three laws of motion, which he used to explain why the planets orbited in ellipses rather than circles around the sun. He was trying to figure out why did this happen, and he created these laws or, or put them on paper. These laws are the foundation for physics and behavior in nature, except for very small bodies like electrons or objects traveling very close to the speed of light when relativity becomes an issue. So let's just go through these three laws. So the first law is sometimes called the law of inertia. The law states that if a body is at rest, uh, like you see the soccer ball is sitting here at rest, or if it's moving at a constant speed in a straight line, it will keep doing what it's doing. A soccer ball that is just sitting there won't do anything unless it is acted upon by a force. You see the foot kicking. Now the ball will move. Now the ball is flying through the air. If you kick that ball in a vacuum and there was nothing there to stop it, you know, if you did this in space, the ball would go forever and it would keep going until it hit the net and the net created a force to stop it from moving. Now, obviously, in the real world, right, if we're on Earth, you know, we would have, you know, air resistance and drag and things like that that we'd have to consider. But in a general sense, an object at rest remains at rest unless acted upon, uh, acted upon by an unbalanced force. And an object in motion will continue with constant speed and direction unless acted on by another unbalanced force. Now, the second law of motion is related but different. So... Newton found that when I want to measure a force, I want to figure out what the force is, I could describe it as mass of the object times its acceleration, or F equals ma. So it describes how forces are related to each other. So consider you're pulling a wagon, and there's persons sitting in the wagon, and you have to pull, you have to apply force. If all of a sudden four people got onto the wagon, the mass increases, you will now need four times as much force to maintain the same acceleration. Or if you use the same force, you might accelerate, but it'll only be one fourth as fast. They are all, you know, um, proportional with each other. So for it, and if you have a fixed mass, if you increase more force, you're gonna get more acceleration. And it always follows that basic pattern. Now the third law is sometimes called the law of action and reaction. So when two bodies interact, they apply forces to one another that are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. This is sometimes described, as you've probably heard, as every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So when you were put walking, you're standing in your room, and you, and you push down on the floor with your weight, the floor pushes back to maintain equilibrium because you're not falling. The fact that you were standing there and you're not moving means the forces must be balanced. So forces must be balanced out if the acceleration is not observed. If you're not moving, if you're not accelerating, if you're moving at a constant speed or you're at rest, then you, your forces must be balanced. Because we just saw that unbalanced forces result in acceleration. That's Newton's second law. So this is talking about like a boy whose feet, if he's trying to step off a boat, he's pushing off to push himself forward. And the boat will then also move too. You've probably had this happen, trying to step off of a boat. And the same thing with when you are walking, you press your foot down and the, fo the floor pushes back and that allows you to move yourself forward. Now, buoyancy is kind of a special type of force, something that's called upthrust. So you've probably all had the experience of trying to push something underneath the water and it keeps trying to bounce back up. And so because all objects that have mass, we have the weight force, the gravity pushing them down, but the fluid will push back against the weight of that object. That's the third law, right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And the deeper you push into the fluid, the higher the pressure is. There's more fluid on top. Therefore, the bottom of the object is always slightly under slightly more pressure than the top. You see how this can, the part that is deeper, has slightly more pressure more force upon it therefore there is intention to push it up and you have to actually push down harder to keep the can underwater and i'm sure we've all experienced that so if you don't do that it will just bob on the surface of the water because the the buoyancy force the buoyance force is going to push it up so then you have to hold it down now we've talked a little bit about weight and versus mass now weight 
is different than mass. Mass is how much matter is inside you. Mass is consistent. If you're standing on Earth, or you're in a vacuum, or you're on Mars, or you're anywhere, the amount of matter inside you is consistent. You have the same mass. But weight, when we talk about how much do you weigh, what's your weight, that is a force calculated by multiplying the mass of an object times its acceleration. You know, force equals ma. On Earth, our gravity is, you know, 9.8 meters per second squared. And what we find is that this same rule applies everywhere. So the law of universal gravitation, which is another thing that Newton created, relates the mass of any two objects and the distance between them to calculate the force. And you can see this formula on the right, you know, m1, m2 times the universal constant g divided by the radius squared. So consider the moon. On Earth, the two masses are u and the Earth. So huge mass of the Earth, and you're pretty close to the mass as far as the radius is, right? That's why there's relatively strong gravity on Earth. If you go to the moon, your mass is the same, but the moon's mass is much lower. Therefore, the gravitational force is less. And on the moon, it's about one-sixth the mass, so it's about one-sixth the weight force. Next section we're going to talk about is electricity. Now, specifically, we'll start with electrostatics. So think electricity, but not moving, statics. So it's a branch of physics that talks about charges while it rests. So think about how static charge, right? We talk about static electricity can build up on the surface of an object. So we've all done the rubbing a balloon on the carpet and you can see the little sparks on it. Like you get zapped, you know, if you're, you were playing with your kid brother growing up or whatever it is you were doing is the electrons are building up on the surface of the balloon and then it discharges and you get that zap. That is electrostatics. Now, electrical circuits are the other option, is that electricity can also flow, because electricity is the flow of electrons, right? So Ohm's law gives us the relationship between the three major things for electrical flow. So we have the current, in you know that that is an amperage right voltage in volts and the resistance which we call ohms which is the omega symbol so this just says that the um you know the current is always related to the voltage divided by the resistance you increase the resistance and you decrease you know you decrease the current and so on so this is an image of a simple circuit the, you know, you have a, a power source, the red, and the electrons are flowing. They go through the resistor, which resists the flow. And we can calculate how much energy is being flown through there using a voltmeter. You measure the voltage across it. So you can measure that flow of power through the resistor. Now, circuits are created in two general formats. So you have series when you have a power supply and you have a flow of electrons and it goes through each item in the circuit in a row. So every piece of the circuit is exposed to the full flow. So this one, number this one on the right, is a series circuit with three resistors and but just one power source. So every resistor gets the full flow of the power. You can also have parallel, which if I took the same power source and the same three resistors, but I wrote them next to each other, then the flow of electrons is split into thirds. So each resistor only gets one third of the total flow. So this is what we call parallel versus series in circuits. Now, as we're talking about allowing this electron flow, there's two basic types of things. And three, which is a newer thing that people have probably seen, is conductors are materials that permit electrons to flow freely. From they, they jump very easily from particle to particle. So this is most metals, you know, copper, iron, water as well, and aluminum, things of this nature that are very, they very quickly conduct electricity. So, you know, wiring in your house is very likely, you know, copper is that, you know, it, it allows very good flow of electrical current. And then you have insulators. So you think about what's wrapped around your power cables that are made of copper. Is, these are materials that impede the flow of electrons so that the electricity cannot flow into your hand if you're holding the power cord. So this is often rubber or wood, uh, as well as glass or even dry air. They're very good insulators. Electrons have a lot of trouble flowing across them. 
And then you have this special class called semiconductors. So these allow some electrons to flow, but not as much as conductors, but they're also not perfectly insulated. We can use those properties when we're building, you know, computers and microprocessors, you know, specifically like silicon, germanium. These are the, you know, if you've heard of silicon chips, those are semiconductors that we can use their electrical properties to build more complicated devices. Now, magnetism is a force that is generated by the motion of electrical charges. When the electricity is flowing, one of those results is, is magnetism. So, when this flow of electron, it creates a magnetic field, which then acts upon other currents and magnetic items. So, if you ever played that game when you have two magnets and you start pushing them close together, they all of a sudden reach a point that they just grab and snap together. That's because their magnetic fields crossed. So, magnets in practical terms are metals that have been magnetized by exposing them to electrical currents. So, those magnets you played with, they have been exposed to strong electrical currents, which has magnetized them and they uh, can generate their own magnetic fields. It has broad applications in modern technology. Electromagnets, sound amplifiers, generators, motors. There's so many ways that magnetism is applied in modern science. Now, energy is one of these things that can be a little harder to find, but in a general sense, energy is the ability to do work, to get things done. That's what energy uses, but there's energy comes in a lot of forms. You know, there's heat energy, chemical energy, gravitational energy. We've already talked about that. Electrical energy, you know, light. You know, if you flipped on a light switch, you turned electrical into light energy, right? As well as motion, like, you know, inertia. When you're moving about, you have energy. And these forms of energy can be generally grouped into two kinds. So we have potential energy that I'm not currently using, but I could use. It's been stored some way. And then kinetic, which is working or movement energy. Something's in motion, something's happening, and it has energy. Now, kinetic energy, as we said, is the energy related to movement and the work being performed. So, kinetic energy really depends on the mass of the object in motion as well as the square of its velocity. So, we say kinetic energy is one-half the mass times the velocity squared. This is how, if I throw a baseball... If I were to measure this information about the baseball, its mass times its velocity squared and then divided by two would tell me how much kinetic energy the ball has right before it hits the glove of the catcher. Now, potential energy is energy held in its object, uh, specifically due to its mass and position relative to other objects. Now, there's chemical energy and there's different things like that, but the most typical kinds is gravitational potential energy. So it's calculated with its mass and its height above a point along with the acceleration due to gravity. So I have a rock on top of a cliff and I want to push the rock over. It has energy. If I push it to the edge of the cliff and the cliff is not holding it up anymore, the rock will fall because it has potential energy. It wants to fall. The cliff has to resist it to keep it from happening. But when it falls off the cliff and it starts moving, that starts becoming kinetic energy rather than potential. Now, as we referenced in the last slide, just as there's a conservation of mass, there is the conservation of energy. So the total energy of any system can be transformed, but cannot be created or destroyed. The amount of energy in the universe is fixed. We can move it around, but we can't make more of it. So springs and pendulums, and especially roller coasters, one of my favorites, illustrates this law. So consider a roller coaster, if you're gonna to go to Silver Dollar City or something like that. As you go up the hill, you know, you maybe had mechanical energy, like the clack, 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 clack. The machine is lifting you up. So it's taking energy to give you height. When you reach the top of the first hill, you have a lot of potential energy, right? If you just jumped off, you would fall and you wouldn't have to do anything. But then right as you go over, you start getting more and more and more speed, right? You see how in the middle that you're about 50% kinetic energy and 50% potential energy? Well, at the bottom, right before you go back up, your speed is as high as it's going to go but you're no longer off the ground anymore. So your potential energy is now zero and your kinetic energy is 100. Then as it goes back up, let's say the next hill is lower, you'll pick back up some potential energy, but you're still moving pretty fast, slower than you were at the bottom of the hill, but still you have mostly kinetic energy. Now, of course, you can have vibrations and noise and heat that might be generated that also makes you lose some energy. 
But this is a good illustration of how that energy is conserved and transformed. It is never created and it's never destroyed. Now, just because the energy is conserved doesn't mean that it doesn't move around inside and outside of systems, just like we talked about. So we have two different kinds of systems that we might look at with energy. So an open system is where energy can be transferred between the system and its surroundings. So we talked about boiling water on a stovetop. So you're adding heat to the water. The water is boiling. But then you also could have heat can be let out into the air. All the heat that comes off the stove does not necessarily go into the water. So it's not just the pot, the water, and the stove. There's also the air. There's, you know, your face. If you're close to it, you can feel that heat on your face. It's transferred to you. So this is an open system. Now, a closed system, obviously, is the exact opposite, where all the energy must be contained and it can't transfer anywhere else. So think about a heavily insulated coffee mug. You put hot coffee in there and you seal the lid. The coffee stays hot because the heat energy can't escape. It's been insulated so well with those insulators around it. If it's using cork or, you know, air gap or something. And the heat energy cannot leave the coffee and then burn your hand, right? You don't want the cup to get really, really hot because it'll burn you. So that would be more of a closed system. So those are the two kinds of systems and how the energy might transfer. Now, talking about our uh, boiling water on the stove concept is heat is thermal energy, right? That's one of the most universal energy types in the world. And it has three ways that you transfer. So let's consider, if I start boiling the water and the pot gets hot and I reach up and I touch the handle and the handle is hot, well, the handle is not touching the actual heating element, right? It conducted because the water got hot and the pot, the pot got hot, the water got hot, and the handle got hot. And it conducted that heat energy through the object. You can see in this object, in this image here, that it's pretty hot right up against the bolt, right up against the uh, the pot. Now, convection is heat transfer due to flow of a fluid. So think about the water. When it starts to heat, the water at the bottom gets hot first, and then it rises because its density has shifted. It's less dense now that it's hot. The molecules and the are moving very very quickly, and they shift. And that flow of water is called convection because it brings heat to the surface. So if you've seen like boiling water, it's rolling and flowing, that's convection and it's moving the heat energy throughout the fluid. And finally is radiation. This would be when you can feel heat from something, but you're not directly touching it. So if you put your hand kind of near the stovetop, you can feel the heat, like your hand feels hot even if you're not touching it. So it's being radiated to your skin and you can feel that as well. So it's a, it's a great example of all three types of energy transfer all at once. Now, in the same way with transformation, since energy must be conserved, it does transform from one type to another. And we've talked about several of these, but here's a few extra examples. So chemical to mechanical. An internal combustion engine takes gasoline and burns it. It creates heat then that heat is, is used to turn a mechanical system that allows you to turn the tires on your car. So that is chemical to mechanical energy. Or electrical to mechanical. If you have a battery that goes into your drill and then you turn the drill, now the drill head is something mechanical. You're going to turn a screw or you're going to use a sander. That mechanical work is being provided through the electrical supply. Electrical to heat and light. So think about an incandescent light bulb, you know, an old school light bulb. You have electricity that flows into your house. When you flip that light switch on, the, all of a sudden the bulb is emitting light. It's taking the electricity and transforming it into light. But it's also getting hot. So it's also generating some heat. Now obviously LED bulbs generate much less heat, therefore they are more efficient. And that's why they've become so popular in recent years. It still converts energy into light, and, but it just makes less heat. So it doesn't waste as much energy. And then, of course, you have heat to motion to electrical. So think about a hot water boiler, if you've ever been to a power plant. is If you're boiling water, that it uses that to turn a turbine, which then is turning an electrical generator. So that mechanical energy, that motion, is turning a generator, which is creating a magnetic field to make electricity. And then you can send the electricity. Virtually all electrical generation uses this same basic premise. 
And that completes middle school science module four. So you've now done chemical reactions and physics. Now module five will color, cover the life sciences. Thank you so much.